criticism by claiming that the criticism is fake news. So I want to congratulate all of you for the important work you are doing uh, in trying to make the American people a moment in American history. Not only are we going to take on Trump's lies and his hatred and his racism and his sexism and his homophobia and his xenophobia and his religious bigotry. Other than that, I think he's doing a pretty good job. But the way we take him on is by doing exactly the opposite of what he is trying to do. He is trying to divide us up by the color of our skin or where we were born. And what our campaign is bringing people together, black and white and Latino, Asian American, Native American, gay and straight, native born immigrant around a progressive agenda which demands that we have an economy and a government that works for all and not just the one percent and uniquely this campaign is prepared to tell Wall Street and the insurance companies and the drug companies and the military industrial complex and the fossil fuel industry that they can no longer determine all that happens quality, which to my mind is a very, very, very serious issue facing this country. It is not, not acceptable to me that three people now own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people, all that at a time when so many of our people are working two or three jobs. 49% of all new income goes to the top 1%. We got to talk about that issue and we got to deal with that issue. But in the midst of that massive disparity between the very, very rich and everybody else, there is another kind of disparity that exists and that is the racial disparity in America. So today we are living in a country which, as all of you know, where white families own 10 times more wealth than black families. We are living in a country where when 87 million Americans are uninsured or underinsured, the situation is far worse in the African-American community, where maternal deaths, women giving birth, three times higher than for white women, where infant mortality is two and a half times higher, where there clearly are not enough black doctors, black nurses, black psychiatrists, social workers. So when we talk about disparity, we talk about national crises, but we understand the disparity within the African American, impacting the African American community. And that means hundreds of thousands of bright young kids cannot afford to go to college because of their limited income of their family. It is a crisis which disproportionately impacts African American young people who 12 years after they leave school find themselves more in debt than when they took out their student debt in the first place. So when we have a national is about. Four years ago, I talked about raising the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. People said that was a wild, that was extreme, couldn't be done. Since then, seven states have done that. And as you know, several weeks ago, the US House of Representatives passed a $15 an hour minimum wage. And when we do that, and as president, I will certainly do that. That means we address the crisis where half, half of African-American workers today are making less than $15 an hour. It will be a raise for half of African-American workers. 
and when I talk about the need to make public colleges and universities tuition free, when I talk about the need to cancel student debt that impacts the entire country, it will disproportionately impact the African American community. And when I talk about, and we've made huge progress on this over the last four years, that we must understand, and the American people do understand, that health care is a human right, not a privilege. And this is something that will impact every American. No more deductibles, no more co-payments, no more out-of-pocket expenses, no more seeing a half a million Americans every year go bankrupt for the crime of having been sick and having a large medical bill. That will impact the entire country. It will significantly impact the African-American community. And when we talk about criminal justice, when we talk about ending a criminal justice system that is not only broken but is racist, we are talking about investing in African-American and minority communities so the kids have the education and the job training that they need so that they will not in highly disproportionate numbers end up in jail. Four years ago, I talked about ending the war on drugs and legalizing marijuana, which is a major issue, and I'm happy to tell you, as you know, state after state is moving in that direction. This is a national issue. It is an African-American issue, because for people who smoke marijuana, and it's about equally distributed between the white community and the black community, if you're black, you're six times more likely to be arrested. Today in America, 20% of the people in jail, unbelievably, are in jail for the crime of being poor. They cannot afford cash bail. We're going to eliminate cash bail in this country. Senator. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> How you doing? Thank you. I didn't, I didn't mean to, to no, cut. No, that's good. I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> you're, you're not the first. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of broadcast journalists in, in the room. Uh, we, we know how to hit a commercial break. Um, <laughs> let's, let, let's start with your Medicare for All plan, because one of the things I, I noticed at the debate last week on, a, on another network, um, th there, there seems to be, among Democrats right now, um, you seem to be quite divided. Um, there, there seem to be two camps, and this may be a bit of an oversimplification, but there, there seem to be candidates like Bernie Sanders who, who believe that health care is a, a human right um, and that Medicare should be um, readily available uh, to all Americans. Uh, some have even said undocumented immigrants. There seems to be some confusion, or at least there was last, last week, over precisely how you would pay for that. Can you clear that up? Sure. Do you mind if I stand? Sure. Okay. Do you, do you, did you bring props? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Should we stand right. with you? The question is how we pay for it. Well, the answer is we are already paying for it. Let's be clear. In my view, this is not really a debate about health care. This is a debate, debate about profits and greed. Health care system is working fantastic. If you are the pharmaceutical industry where 10 companies made $69 billion in profits when one out of five Americans cannot afford the medicine they need. System is working great if you are the insurance industry where the top five insurance companies made $23 billion in profits last year. Over the last 30, over the last 20 years, the healthcare industry has spent over $4 billion in lobbying and campaign contributions to give us a system in which 87 million are uninsured or underinsured, where we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, where a half a million people go bankrupt with medical bills every year. This is not a debate about a rational health care system. This is a debate about whether we have the guts to take on the health care industry, which is enormously powerful. So how do you pay for it? We are now spending twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country. In Canada, you go to any doctor you want, you have heart surgery, you're in the hospital for a month, you come out, there is no bill, there is no bankruptcy. 
health care is a human right. They spend 50 percent of what we spend. So the but way you to, pay to for it fair, is not. Uh, I'm to sorry. Be fair, Senator, the, the Canadian economy is much smaller yeah. than the American economy. Far yeah. fewer people in Canada than, than in the United States yeah. of America. So is, is it fair to convince Absolutely. Of course it is. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's not, you know, when you talk about Germany, you talk about UK. Let's be clear. We are the only country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people as a right. What other countries do and what we have got to do is pay for this through public financing and come up with a progressive tax system that says that in a time of massive income and wealth inequality, yeah, the wealthy and large corporations are going to pay more. And at the end of the day, according to every study that I have seen, at the end of the day, Medicare for all will cost the American people less than the current dysfunctional system. And our plan will cost the overwhelming majority of the American people less than they're paying for health care right now. Senator, now what, Mark? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Just of, getting warmed up. Should I stand up now? Yes. <laughs> Part of this health care discussion is also about abortion and reproductive yes. rights and reproductive yes. justice. This year alone, we have seen several states, thanks to their Republican-controlled state legislatures, passing some of the most strict restrictions on abortion I've seen in my short lifetime. Yes. Why is it important for a woman to have the ability to choose whether or not to get an abortion? And if you were elected president, how would you ensure that we would have that right, as we've seen these state legislatures do what they want to do, regardless of who's in office? Well, I'll stop. <laughs> we could dance, too. I okay. mean, <laughs> I'm not very good at dancing. Uh, just for, to be clear, as somebody who has a 100% pro-choice lifetime voting record, we do something which was controversial in the midst of controversy, and that is writing this Medicare for All bill. What we say is reproductive rights are health care. And that means that every woman in America under a Medicare for All single payer program will have the right to have an abortion and other uh, reproductive uh, issues dealt with. So we cover that. Now, why is it, you know, I get very tired of the hypocrisy of some of my conservative colleagues who say, you know, we believe in small government, we believe in getting the government off your back, right? That's what they believe. Apparently, except when it comes to a woman having the right to control her own body. So, you know, all I can say is, you know, it is your body. It is not the body of a politician in Washington or a state capital or a local government. This is a difficult decision. Women and their physicians will make different decisions. But at the end of the day, this is a decision for the women of this country and not for politicians. Now, Senator, you mentioned another tightly connected issue within reproductive justice in your opening remarks, which you talked about the maternal and infant mortality crisis yes. among black folks. Now, I know Medicare for All is your platform for dealing with problems like this, but we know from studies that this is a crisis that affects women who have insurance as well. Right. And we also know that what, one of the main predictors of maternal mortality is the experience of racism, not necessarily economic injustice or lack of access to health care. What do you have planned to deal with this aspect of maternal mortality and this reproductive justice aspect? I agree with you, issue? absolutely. Look, there is no question but that when the day comes, and it will come, and I hope sooner or later, where health care is a right for all people, we are going to make a lot of progress in terms of infant mortality and maternal health. But your point is well taken. And that is, on top of all of the other health care crises that we face, we do face the problems of racism, and we do place, pray, uh, face the problem that in African-American communities, among other things, there are not enough black doctors, there are not enough black nurses, or other black professionals. And that ties, so what we have got to do is focus a special attention on those distressed communities where healthcare outcomes are bad, and that is exactly what we will be doing. And it's not just urban areas, it is rural areas as well. When you have a healthcare system which is not designed to make profits 
for insurance companies to provide quality care for all. You have the freedom to ask the question, why is infant mortality rate? Why are the maternal death rates for black women higher? And we can focus and put resources into that. But one area that we really do have to be aggressive on is making sure that there are more African-American healthcare professionals right now in underserved areas than we have. And that is exactly what we will do with Medicare for All. I want to go back to something that you, you mentioned. You've talked a, a lot about canceling student debt yes. in addition to uh, free uh, four-year tuition at public universities and colleges, but specifically on canceling student debt. As someone who just maybe two or three years ago finished paying off his student debt, <laughs> how, how, is it, how is it fair to, to those who sacrificed mightily for years to pay off their student debt to all of a sudden decide that the government should step in and swoop in and forgive a few trillion dollars in student debt. I'm asking, I'm, I'm asking objectively for a friend. See, see, what he's angry about is we didn't, come with, we, we didn't come up with that idea 10 years ago, right? Well. All right, look. Let me rephrase your question. How's yeah, that? Sure. All right. <laughs> How is it possible that the United States Congress 11 years ago provided the largest bailout in history for the crooks, and I use that word advisedly, on Wall Street who destroyed our economy? And not only a $700 billion bailout, but trillions of dollars in zero interest loans. How is it possible that under Trump, a few years ago, the Congress, needless to say, against my vote, gave over a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top 1% in large private corporations. Right. That's what happens when people have power. Wall Street has power, the billionaire class has power. The 45 million people who are carrying student debt, I just talked to some young African-American kids today who are dealing with that debt. Kids who cannot get married and have kids Kids cannot buy a home, can't even buy a car, that their whole life is being structured around the fact that they have to pay these oppressive debts every single month. So here is my view. We told this generation, millennials, we said, go out and get a college education. And many of them did, right? And you went deeply into debt, right? And that debt is oppressing every decision you make. Is that right? All right, we're doing well here. All right. And the answer is, the answer is, it seems to me that in the richest country in the history of the world, when we give tax breaks to billionaires and bail out Wall Street, that we got to give this generation a chance. The truth is, the millennial generation, for the first time in the modern history of this country, will have a lower standard of living than their parents. They're carrying... Don't answer the question. The answer... I am answering the question. And that I think instead of bailing out Wall Street and giving tax breaks to billionaires, we should save an entire millennial generation and give them a shot for a decent life. That's my answer. Now, can, can, we, can we also, for future reference, not scream out questions from the audience, just for future reference? So you touched the nerve there, I think. Well, I, no, I think you touched the nerve. <laughs> I, I think you touched the nerve. But, 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 but to, to be fair, how would you decide who gets the bailout? How would you decide which college student, how much money, and uh, what's... Give, this give, is a, I mean, that's a good question, and we thought about it, and we thought the simplest, fairest, the most effective way to do it was to cancel all student debt for 45 million people. Now, you might ask, which is a fair question. It is a fair question. All right, that's a lot. It, it, that program, making public colleges and universities tuition-free, and canceling all student debt is about a $2.2 trillion cost over a 10-year period, which is a lot of money. How do we raise the money? Well, we raise the money by imposing a relatively small tax on Wall Street speculation. All right, Wall Street last year, the top six banks made $110 billion in profits. They were bailed out by the American people after they caused severe harm to our economy. They can afford a small tax that tax will more than make up the cost of making all public colleges and universities tuition 
free and canceling student debt. Look, I understand that not everybody here agrees with me. But at the end of the day, what I believe is when you have a massive level of income and wealth inequality, when so many people are struggling, when you've got 40 million people living in poverty while a handful of people have unbelievable wealth, well, yeah, I do believe. And the essence of what I am fighting for is to create an economy which says to those people on top, you are going to have to start paying your fair share of taxes. You can't stash your profits in the Cayman Islands and in Bermuda. And we are going to create an economy that works for all of us. So people want to be critical. I got it. But that is what I believe. Now, Senator. In your previous answer, you mentioned millennials. <laughs> In your previous answer, you mentioned millennials, yes. right? I actually believe probably about half of this room is younger than millennials. This is Gen Z now, right? A lot of yellow. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be careful yeah, where yeah, you yeah. tread. Well, well, no, no. <laughs> So what I want to ask is a lot of your message is carried over from 2016 when you mean is Bernie you're really repetitious you keep saying the same thing and the answer is yeah it's true <laughs> and my response to that is that when we address the massive level of income and wealth inequality. When we address a corrupt political system in which a handful of billionaires can spend hundreds of millions of dollars to elect candidates to represent the wealthy and the powerful. When finally the United States joins every other major country on earth and guarantees health care to all people. When we make public colleges and universities tuition free. Okay. When we cancel student debt, when we tackle the existential crisis of climate change. You know what? I'll stop talking about those issues. All right? But that is what we have got to do. I know media likes a new story every day. Sorry. That's not my style. And what we have got to do is focus on why things are. I want everybody to think about, think about, ask me, how does it happen that after all of the campaigns and all of the speeches and all of the party platforms, the average American worker is not making a nickel more today than he or she did 45 years ago. How does it happen that over the last 30 years, there has been the richest 1% have seen a 21%, $21 trillion increase in their wealth, bottom half of America seen a decline in their wealth. How does that happen? Do we talk about it in Congress? No. Do we talk about it in the media? No. Why not? These are issues that have got to be discussed. We are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And we do not need to have people sleeping out on the streets. We do not need to have people spending half of their limited incomes on housing. We do not need to have kids suffering under oppressive student debt. We do not have to see black mothers dying in childbirth at rates that are unfathomable in terms of the developed world. This is the richest country in the world. And finally, we're going to have to say, and I know this is sensitive. I know people don't like to hear it. But you've got to finally say to the people who own this country, who control our economy, who control our politics, they cannot have it all. We are going to create an economy that works for all of us. All right. Thank you. Senator, thank you. We uh, only have a little bit more time. I want to try to get in two very quick questions. Um, let's play a hypothetical game. You win the election and become president. Republicans can maintain control of the Senate. Mitch McConnell has said he will be the Grim Reaper and veto anything that comes to his desk that looks like a socialist democratic policy. How will you get any of these things passed in Congress if Republicans still control the Senate? A very brief answer, Senator. Because <laughs> then we've got to get to immigration quickly. Yes, okay. We will do it the way real change has always taken place. And that is rally millions of people in McConnell's own state of Kentucky, which happens to be a poor state, by the way, to demand that their elected officials start listening to them rather than campaign contributors. 
Quick question on immigration. Quick right question. First. We've seen this humanitarian crisis at the border. What is one thing that must change to avoid that crisis moving forward? Um, we've got to do away with these privately owned detention centers. We will not, as a nation, under a Bernie Sanders presidency, be ripping tiny babies from the arms of their mothers. And we will pass comprehensive immigration reform. Senator Sanders, thank you. Thank hey. you for your comments. You have two minutes. Oh, okay. If you'd like to make some closing remarks. Yeah. Look, the, I know that not everybody in the room agrees with everything I say, right? But at the end of the day, what my campaign is about is asking pretty simple questions. How does it happen that in countries around the world, every major country, health care is a human right, and they spend a fraction per capita of what we spend? How does that happen? How does it happen that 10 days ago I took a trip to Canada with people who were dealing with diabetes and they were able to buy insulin for one-tenth of the price charged in the United States of America? How does it happen that we have a system where the Koch brothers and a handful of billionaires can spend hundreds of millions of dollars buying elections? How does it happen that we have half of our people living paycheck to paycheck? And the reality that we have got to deal with, which is an uncomfortable reality, a reality not discussed in Congress, far too rarely discussed in the media, is that you have a corporate elite in this country who could care less about the average working class person in this country, who are consumed by greed, who are not happy enough that the top 1% now owns more wealth than the bottom 92%. They want more. They want more tax breaks. They want to cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and education. And what this campaign is about is, in fact, as you mentioned, is a political revolution. It's not just getting me elected. It is bringing millions of people to stand up and fight for change in the only way that change has ever taken place whether it is the labor movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement. Those changes never took place from the top on down, always from the bottom on up, when millions of people stood up and fought for economic justice, racial justice, Senator. social justice, and that's what this campaign is about. Thank you all very much. Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator, I'll forget you.